I surrender. Oh. In 1896, the year 1896, a man by the name of J.W. Devander. Everybody say Devander. Devander. He literally was an art teacher. And, and, and he, it was a tugging on his heart to want to go out and be a, travel, a traveling minister. He had friends. Everybody say friends. I want y'all to keep that word in mind. He had friends that would always encourage him. This is what you need to do. God has called you to full-time ministry. But there was a tugging on the inside of him. There was a struggling that was going on on the inside of him. Until literally, one day, he says, you know what? I'm done with this. I can't bear this load on my own. I can't do it. I'm in my own strength anymore. And, 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 and he said three words that would change his life. He's putting pen to paper and a song came out of it. I surrender all. Not knowing that he had a song on the inside of his heart. And this hymn would literally go throughout this generation, go throughout generations for generations and generations to come. It would ring in the ears of people. I surrender all. So he quit his full-time job as being an art teacher. And he went out to become a traveling evangelist. But it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know you got some situations. You, you know you have to surrender. But you know it's not going to happen overnight. Amen. It literally took him five years. Everybody say five years. five years. See, five is the number of grace. It's the number of God's unmerited favor. That's literally him taking his hand off of the situation. The Bible says, by the grace of God, I am what I am in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. So he said, I surrender all. Not just some, but I surrender all. And like we talked about last week, trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? With all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He'll bring it into fruition because he makes everything beautiful in its time, according to Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. And that word beautiful means mature. He brings it at, at, at the set and appointed time. Everybody say, I surrender all. Let's start off by going to Exodus chapter uh, 17. Exodus. So give you a backdrop of what the word Exodus actually means. The word Exodus literally means I'm exiting. They were exiting. The Israelites were exiting from out of captivity. They were exiting from out of bondage. They were exiting from out of exile. Exodus, Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Let's go to uh, uh, verse 8. Let's start at verse 8. Surrender. I surrender. I surrender. What's the first two words? They quiet. They quiet. I don't know. Y'all got me speaking in tongues already. Amalekites. <laughs> the Amalekites. Everybody say kites. kites. Say ites. ites. Anytime you look at scripture and you see that I-T-E-S, the ites, what that actually means is the descendant of. Right? The Amorites, the Amalekites, all of those ites. Everything going to be I. When you look in scripture and you see the ice, that means the descendant of, that's a posterity, not prosperity, posterity, meaning your future generations. The Amalekites, they came and did what? Attacked. Wait a minute. They came and attacked. The Amalekites. Now, if you go back to the original text and you study out what the name Amalekite means, it means the dweller in the valley. To dwell doesn't mean to visit. To dwell means to live there. See, and God didn't call us to dwell in the valley. He called us to walk through the valley. Amen. I can prove that to you because David said in Psalms 23 verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. And, 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 and you find yourself in situations where people want to tug on you to get you to stay in one place. The dweller 
of the valley. You have to watch out for those type of people. You have to watch out for those who want to dwell in the valley because one thing that you have to understand about the dweller in the valley, a valley literally means a low place. And I heard somebody say it like this when I was growing up. Misery loves company. The dweller of the low place, the dweller that's, oh, the dweller that's in the bottom. They want you to stay there. Watch this. People love the you that you were when you were not what God called you to be. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. People love the you that you were when you were not what God called you to be because that person could easily be manipulated. That person, that person could easily be controlled. That person could easily be, be taken by force. Come on. But it's not until you surrender all. Amen. You're not surrendering to yourself. You're, sur you're surrendering to a higher power, not a universe, but the God of the universe. Amen. The dweller of the valley. The Amalekites came and attacked. Everybody say attacked. attacked. Anytime God is moving in your life, let me tell y'all something. Anytime God makes a move in your life, there's always going to be an onslaught of Satan. Mm -hmm. You know that, woo, listen to me. You know that God is moving in your life when pressure is being applied to you. Okay, it says that he takes us from faith too. From glory too. And from strength too, but not without a fight. Not without an attack. An onslaught is a destructive attack. The enemy is trying to run after you. He's, traced, he's chasing after you with a hostile intent. It's a lot of hostility in him. The dweller of the valley. And watch this. Uh, uh, thanks be to God because the Bible says in Isaiah 54 verse 15, if anyone does attack you, it would not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. Isaiah 54, verse 15. If anyone does attack you, this is the Father letting you know, if you're in covenant with me, if anyone does attack you, it would not be my doing. Whoever, say whoever. Whoever, whoever attacks you, they will. Not they might, they will surrender to you. Everybody say witchcraft. witchcraft. One thing that you have to understand about witchcraft, the Bible says in 1 uh, Samuel 15, verse 23, it says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as of worshiping idols or idolatry. One thing that you have to understand about witchcraft, witchcraft are these three things, manipulation, intimidation, and domination. Those three things, that's what witchcraft is, manipulation, intimidation, and domination. And there's another one that's brought in. And the reason why manipulation, intimidation, and domination is there is because it's trying to get you to capitulate. Everybody say capitulate. Capitulate literally means to surrender. That's what the enemy's purpose is with witchcraft. He's trying to get you to relinquish your will to him. But we don't submit to anything or anyone but the Father. Say, I won't be manipulated. I won't be intimidated. And I won't be dominated. Because we don't serve that type of father. And the enemy is trying to get you to capitulate. He's trying to get you to draw back. But anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. They're not useful or suitable. Say, I have to be useful. I have to be suitable. I have to be about my father's business. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites. At Raphadam, everybody say Raphadam. Have you ever been minding your own business and you feel like you're in a place of, you know what, I'm just resting and I'm relaxing? And then before you know it, you got all types of things coming at you. Mm -hmm. See, see, because, because Raphadam is a place of rest. See, the enemy is so coward. Listen to me, you guys. The enemy is so coward, it, 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 he's try, he tries to throw a cheap shot. And in boxing, it's the unseen blows that knock you out. They call it the TKO. Everybody say TKO. That's a technical knockout. It's your inability to continue to fight. They want to kick you when you're... Yeah, 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 yeah. But thanks be to God, even in situations, I may be down, but I'm not out. His purpose is to get you to surrender. His purpose is to get you to capitulate. And he always wants to catch you off guard. Raphadam. A place of rest. Let's go to the next verse. Is this bearing witness with y'all's spirit so far? Amen. 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 
Moses said to Joshua, choose all of our men. Some. So when you're going out to battle, when you're going out to battle, everybody can't go with you. You make sure that there are going to be people that's going to stand firm in the profession of their faith. And they're not going to just bring you what you want to hear, but bring you what you need to hear. Because that's what you need in the midst of a battle. You need somebody who's going to bring you the truth and not error and tell you whatever your itching ears want to hear. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Everybody say tomorrow. 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 And one thing that you have to understand about 12 a.m. or 12 midnight, it's the darkest point of the nighttime. But it's also referred to as a dawning of a brand new day. It's however you see it. You can see it as the darkest, the darkest or the gloomiest time of night. Or you can see this as a dawning of a brand new day. I don't know who this is for. But I'm telling you, whatever you're going through right now, you have to see these things from spiritual lenses and not from carnality. Look at it from a spiritual standpoint. And you'll win. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the what? Hill. Hill. With the staff of who? God. Of God in my hand. Now, 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 now the Bible says it clearly. The Bible says clearly in Psalms 23 verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they do what? They comfort me. <laughs> your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, one thing that you have to understand about a, a rod and a staff, the difference between the father's rod and his staff, the rod is a representation of his correction. And a lot of times we don't want to be corrected. In the society that we live in right now, we don't want correction. But the Bible says clearly in Hebrews 12, verse 6, that the Lord disciplines those he loves. Discipline is not punishment for your past, but it's training for your future. It's training for your future to, to, to catapult you or to elevate you to the next phase in your life. So there's a difference between his correction, but this staff is a representation of his protection. Say the father protects me. He protects me. And one thing that you have to understand about sheep, and we're all sheep here, right? We're all sheep. We're all sheep. We're all sheep. We're all sheep. And the scripture says clearly that my sheep, my sheep, that's a distinction. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. Verse 5 and, and, and John chapter 10 says the voice of a stranger they will not follow. So back then in those times what the shepherd would do. You, 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 you see the, the uh, raise your hand if you know how. It's very long and it has a curl on the end of it, right? Like the peppermint. If you turn it over, that looks like the letter J. And the white in the peppermint is a representation of purity. The red in the peppermint is a representation, a representation of the blood, right? So, so, so the reason why the shepherd's staff is, is, is curved over like that is because when, when the sheep would try to go astray, when the sheep would try to leave, he would grab the end of it and bring it all the way back around and wrap it around his neck to bring him back, to let him know, look, you're getting out of bounds right now. Because anybody who breaks a hedge, the serpent shall bite him. You got to stay within the boundaries and the confines of where the father has set you in. Does that make sense to you? See, the scripture says it like this in Galatians 5 verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So if you've experienced freedom, the true freedom, you can't go back to bondage. You can't go back to slavery. And it's something about when somebody has experienced freedom. If you know you've experienced freedom in worship, if you know you've experienced freedom from, from, from manipulative family members or manipulative friends, it's something in you that tells you, no, -uh, don't go back. Don't look back. Uh -uh, don't look back. Because if you look back, you'll turn into a pillar of salt. And salt is a representation of my peace. And if I look back, I know I'm going to lose my peace. And I can't lose my peace. <laughs> Say, I have to keep my peace. I'm not talking about a gun. Y'all get back in the spirit. I have to keep my peace. The staff of God. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. I love, I love this representation of the hill because the hill is a representation of a mountain. That's a high place. Moses said I would stand on top of the mountain. He never said that the mountain would be on top of me. And the Bible says clearly in Matthew 17 verse 20 that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, 
You can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would, and nothing will be impossible for you. So a mountain is a representation of an impossible situation in your life. But Matthew 19, verse 26 says that with God, excuse me, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Zechariah 4 verse 7 says that he would turn our mountains into level ground. He would turn our mountains into a mold hill. That's level ground. So if you speak to the mountain, you'll watch it happen. You'll watch it occur in your life. Now, I'm not telling you to go stand in front of Mount Rushmore and say, move. That mountain ain't did nothing to you. I'm talking about a giant in your life. That's a figurative description of an actual truth. Something that, that, that seems impossible in your life. You have to open up your mouth and you have to speak it. Because I'm a speaking spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 21 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Say I have to speak it. I have to speak it. Let's go to the next verse. Is this blessing y'all this morning? Hallelujah. So Joshua fought the Amalekites. As Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and her went to the top of the what? Yeah. Moses, Aaron, and her. I told y'all in the beginning to remember what word? Friend. Okay, friends. How many of us have? All right, friends. That's the word that I told you to remember. Do me a favor. Do me a favor, bro. Can you hand me that chair over there? Hand me that chair over there. Hand me that, hand me that chair over there. Friends. One thing that you have to understand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I should have just kept you up here, man. I want you to come, come on up here, man. Come on up here, man. Come on up here, man. Come on up here. I want you to sit right here. Come on up here, man. Come up here. Niece and nephew, come here. I see y'all and I see y'all and I just want y'all to come here. I see y'all and I just want y'all to come here. I see y'all and I just want y'all to come here. Watch this. Y'all just stand right here and look awesome for your uncle. Stand right here and look awesome for me. I love the babies. I love the babies. Good. Put a smile on your face. Let me see your mom. All right. Good. 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 So watch this. Watch this. Moses, Aaron, and her. Now Moses' name literally means drawing out. Or to draw out. He was drawn out of the water, but he actually partook in drawing the Israelites from out of Egypt. He was anointed for that. But if you look at Aaron's name, everybody say Aaron. Aaron. Aaron's name literally means a light bringer or a bringer of light. His name means the bringer of light. But there's something different about her's name. Everybody say her. H-E-R, that's H-U-R, her, her. Her's name means whole, H-O-L-E, whole. So I pray about that situation, and I'm like, Lord, whole? Why in the world would this man's name be whole? Because in the midst of these situations, one thing that you have to understand is that you can have a friend who would dig a hole for you or help you out of the hole. So you have to make sure that your friends are positioned in the right place. I want you to stand right here for me. Come over here, sir. Come over here on the other side. Come over here on the other side. And just stand right there. Perfect. 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 They went to the top of the hill. Now let's go to the next verse. Let's go to the next verse. As long, ooh, as long as, everybody say as long as. As long as Moses held up his what? His hands. So I want you to, I want you to lift your hands up. Moses, Moses. Moses, lift, yeah, yeah, lift, lift him up in the There you go, there you go, Mo. There you go, Mo. There you go, Mo. The Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites started winning. So I'm telling you this to say this. I'm showing you this to say this. This has got to be your posture. Because this is a representation of what? Surrender. Father, I surrender all. Because for, for, for me to hold my hands up, that means that I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do this in my own strength. I, I, I can't do it in my own strength. And anytime I let my hands down, anytime I let my guard down, it's like the enemy starts to win. 
The enemy looks at your posture. Y'all y'all think y'all think Satan blind. He's a spirit. He's watching you. He's they're familiar with you. That's why they call them familiar spirits. They're watching you. Oh Lord, I love you. I praise you. I bless you. Going through the motions of life. Insincere speech. Do you really mean it in all with your heart? You don't deny that you're having a bad day. You just don't allow the bad day to have you. Don't allow it to overtake you. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Let's go to the next verse. When Moses' hands grew tired, everybody say friends. friends. <laughs> when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a what? Oh, no. Now, 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 now. Now I was I was I was reading I was reading I, I read this a couple times and when I'm studying and 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 and, and God said read it again I'm like man all right what would you what you hit read it again read it again so I read this thing multiple times and 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 I finally got to this place and He stopped me it never said it never said that they took uh, sand it said they took stone. See, there's a difference between sand and stone. You make sure that in the midst of everything that you're going through, you have friends that's going to lead you to where the stone is. And the Bible says, hallelujah, in, uh, uh, in 1 Peter 2 verse 4, that Christ is the living stone. He's not dead. He's the living stone. So you make sure you have friends that are holding you up and they will always drive you back to the word of God. That's the stone and not sand. Because, because sand will sink, but the foundation of a stone cannot be shaken. It cannot be moved. Say, I have to stand on the stone. When, when Moses' hand grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him. That's what he was sitting on. And he sat on it. Aaron and her, they held up his hands. I want you to lift your hands up. Y'all yeah, touch his elbow. Touch his elbow. Touch his elbow. Moses, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and Aaron and her, when his hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it and don't grow weary in well-doing. You can grow weary in well-doing. <laughs> Lord, Lord, they, they zap in my strength. They taking everything from me. Who encourages the encourager? I'm getting everything. I'm pouring, I'm pouring out everything, but I'm not getting anything in return. Make sure that when you're, when you're communicating with individuals, make sure that you know what the purpose of that conversation is. You have to learn how to, you, you have to, learn how to start to, to position and reposition people in your lives. Because if you place them in an, in, an, in an unhealthy place, that sets you up for an unrealistic expectation. And you get your strength zapped from you. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other side, on the other, so that his hands go to the next. Remain steady until when? Until sunset. So we're going to say for, for illustration purposes that, that nephew, that, 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 that you're Aaron. And I said Aaron's name means what? A light bringer or a bringer of light. So these two friends are very significant in your life. These two friends mean a lot in your life because these are going to be the ones that God is going to send to hold your hands up. He's a light bringer, a bringer of light. But watch out for friends who try to bring you guards. For, for friends, who try to, friends who try to bring you darkness. Watch out for those type of individuals. Girl, you know they say. Girl, you know he's saying. Girl, it is it, and it is it, it is it, it is it. And then before you know it, boom. One hand is up and the other one is down. Because you're bringing all of these morsels. And that's what gossip is equated to. Gossip is equated to a morsel. And what a morsel is, a morsel is little nibbles. You'll never be fulfilled off of a morsel. You're going to always want more information. That's the word of God. 
That's what it says. But then you have this friend who's going to bring you out of a hole. You have this person who's going to be with you through thick and thin. You have this person who's going to be with you in spite of what's going on. Now, one thing that you have to understand about the word friend, friend is a covenantal word. We throw the word friend around so loosely. And let me tell you something. There is a difference between God's promises and his covenant. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. There's a difference between his promises and his covenant. Y'all can put your hands down because I know you're going to grow tired, Moses. <laughs> his promises. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says that the promises of God are yes and amen. His promises are his divine assurances of good. But a covenant, watch this, a covenant is an ongoing relationship pointed in. An ongoing relationship, not a religion. An ongoing relationship. We serve a relational God. He can relate to us. That has no appointed end. Now, one thing that you have to understand about a promise, the Bible says in, in, in Job, everybody say Job, Job 36 verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. That's a promise, right? If they obey and serve him, serve the father, they will, not they might, they will spend the rest of their, the rest of their days. That's the end, right? That's the end to that. That's talking about in this present state of existence. They will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. Now, if you want to know about a covenant, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's a covenant because there's no end to it. That's perpetual. It's ongoing. So you have promises, but you also have covenants. Is that making sense to y'all so far? Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to show you about the covenants of God. Show you about his covenants. Who has a, a covenant is a will and a testament, right? So if I turn this around, what does it say? <laughs> huh? That's Old Testament. Say, that's an old covenant. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. That's a covenant. It's not a promise. His promises are inside of his covenant. Does that make sense to you? His promises are inside of his covenant, and you attain it, you attain it through obedience. Does that make sense to y'all? Hallelujah. Flow, Holy Spirit. This is good. And then I go to Malachi. Everybody say Malachi. All right? Go to the book of Malachi. And when I go to the book of Malachi, after the book of Malachi, this is where it's said to believe that the, that, the, that the Bibles were locked up in monastery. This is where the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages actually came in, right? Where God would act, was actually silent for 400 years, okay? Now, after the book of Malachi, we have something else. And what does that say? That says the what? New say it's a new covenant, right? And we have a new covenant that's established on better promises. We have a new covenant that's established on better promises. So there's a difference between God's promises and his covenant. But his promises are attained inside of his covenant. Does that make sense to y'all? I want y'all to praise God for my help up here. My help. My help. Uh, go, have, go have a seat. Unless you want to sit there, man. You can sit there if you want to. You can sit there if you want to. Everybody say surrender. surrender. The word surrender. Hold on. We, I'm, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go back here in just a second. The word surrender is an agreement to stop fighting. <laughs> it's an agreement to stop fighting. Raise your hand if you know in some areas you need to stop fighting. It's an agreement to stop. I, I, can, I can probably just finish. the. That, that can just be the whole definition right there, huh? I'm agreeing with the Father to stop fighting. It is said to believe. Watch this. It's said to believe that that you know. And I've had a few friends that are uh, that, that that are lifeguards during the summertime. And it's said to believe that through their training, through their training, they are taught that you cannot save an individual until they stop fighting. If that person is kicking and slapping and punching all in the water, you are supposed to back up from them as a lifeguard. 
Why? Because if you go up and you try to and you try to save them or rescue them, you'll stand a chance of drowning with them. So in the midst of these situations, you cannot so somebody will not surrender or you can't save an individual until they're willing to surrender. In agreement to stop fighting. Say I have to agree to stop fighting. It's an agreement to stop fighting, to stop hiding or resisting means to yield to the power or control or possession of another upon compulsion or demand. An agreement to stop fighting, hiding, resisting means to yield to the power, control or possession of another upon compulsion or demand. I have to agree to stop fighting. I have to agree to stop fighting. Let's go to the next. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites. He overcame, meaning he triumphed or he conquered the Amalekite army with the what? With the sword. With the sword. Now, one thing that you have to understand about the sword is that the Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 17 that the sword is the, the word of God. That's the only way you're going to be able to win the battle that's ahead, that, that's ahead of you through the word of God. The Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify means to set apart, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So anything outside of the word of God becomes opinionated. Anything outside of the 66 books, you have just found yourself in an emotional realm that has nothing to do with profit. But everything to do with you not gaining a result pertaining to the things of God. Wow. And that, uh, let's go there. Oof. Let's go to 2 Samuel 23, 10. 2 Samuel 23, verse 10. I believe this is the one about Eleazar. Mm. 2 Samuel 23, 10. Hallelujah. Verse 13. 2 Samuel 23, 10. Hallelujah. Now, this is when David's men would act, would act, would out, would, were out battling, and, 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 and some of his relatives were a part of it. But he stood his ground and struck down the what? The Philistines till his hand grew tired and did what? And froze to the, to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned. Watch this. This is talking about a guy by the name of Eleazar, I believe it is. It says that his hands grew tired. Whose hands up here grew tired? Moses. And I don't care how tired you grow as long as your hands don't leave this sword. I don't care how I don't care how tired your hands grow. I don't care how faint you get because the enemy's purpose is to wear you out. But as long as you have this word of truth, that's all that matters. That's how you combat the enemy with the word of truth, with the word of God. Say, I have to keep the word on me. I have to keep the word on me. And, I, and not only on me, I have to keep it in me. That's why David said in Psalms 119 verse 11, your word have I hidden in my heart. That I might not sin against you. When I hide something, that means that it's precious to me. It's valuable to me. It's a treasure to me. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's go back to Exodus 17 verse uh, 13, I believe we were. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Exodus 17, 13, I believe we were. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Let's go to the next. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of, go to the next, Amalek from under heaven. Let's go to the next. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my what? Amen. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my victory. Let's go to the next verse. See, and that's, 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 if you go back to the original in that, that's, that's Yahweh or Jehovah Nisi. Yahweh Nisi. He's my victory. He's my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to where? Generation. To generation. For hands were lifted up to 
the throne of the Lord. So anytime you lift your hand up to the throne of the Father, I can promise you he's there to fulfill everything that concerns you. All you have to do is lift your hands up in complete and total surrender, and he has you. He has you. We, um, this has been a phenomenal week, man, because we, um, I've been going back and reminiscing on a lot of different things. And one of the things that I've been reminiscing on is, 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 is my actual football career. Football literally became a God in my life. The passion, the fire, the, the zeal that I had in my approach towards football. Now God has shifted that towards the things of him. He put it in his proper place. He put it where it's supposed to be. I never forget one of the last games that I played. The last game that I played my junior season of high school. We played against a we played against a team called the um, the the Port Isabel Tarpons. Everybody say Port Isabel. It went down as the highest scoring game in UIL history. The the, the final score was sixty three to sixty one, and this is a football game. I had five touchdowns. 221 yards. Our player ended up going out. He ended up going out in the beginning of, of the game, so I had to put a lot on my shoulders, and we had a lot of people that rose up. We're battling back and forth, back and forth. Nobody wanted to surrender. But what it came down to at the end, what it came down to at the end was Port Isabel was a little bit more. Everybody say a little bit more. They was a little bit more conditioned than we were. <laughs> they had a little bit more endurance that we have that, 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 than we had. And as a result of that, they ended up winning the game. See, the Bible says that finishing is better than starting and patience is better than pride. So I have to endure to the end in spite of what's going on, in spite of what I, uh, in spite of what I see around me. I can't finish too soon. I have to pace myself. It's going back to the endurance again. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will endure. It will remain forever. And I found myself. I found myself reminiscing on, on, on the old days and find myself going back and, 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 and I didn't dwell on it, but I went back and revisited it. Because if I dwell on it, I'll find myself in a sunken place. But I can thank God for where he's brought me from because all of that was a development for who I am now. See, you can go back and revisit certain situations, but don't dwell there. Because if you live there, if you live there, you'll never see what the Father has for you in the future. The Bible says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. What is the past? The past is a portion of my future I've already lived out. That's what the past is. Because he's doing a new thing in our lives. Say it's going to be new. It's going to be new. It's going to be new. Is this making sense to y'all so far? Let's go to hallelujah. It's just so much, Father. It's so much. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Love your word. Love your word. We doing good on Facebook? We all right? Good, good, good. I love y'all Facebook. We, we good? Now give me, give me some. Wow, I was going to say hearts. We don't get, we, we get, we get hearts on now? You get hearts on, you get hearts on Facebook? All right, cool, cool. I mean, we Instagram it, huh? I don't know about this stuff. She wanna be having to help me. She'll be having to help me. Having to help me. Thumbs up or something. <laughs> meanwhile, everybody say meanwhile. meanwhile. Meanwhile, Saul. Saul was still doing what? Breathing, Breathing out murderous threats. Have you ever had a threat come against you? A threat is a declaration of an intention to inflict harm or pain. A declaration of an intention to inflict harm. I had a guy tell me once before, and this was this this was a few years ago. You know, God was God was actually telling me, you know, uh, 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 to you know do some situations for my family, and 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 and, and an older gentleman he comes up to me and just said, uh, "I don't want you to do something that you're going to regret." And when I tell you. Little words right there. 
Your words are seeds. Just those little words right there kind of hit my soul. And had me to and had me to question what I knew the father had told me. Had me to question it. Breathing out things. And, and it wasn't what he said as much as it was the as, as much as it was the motivation behind how he said it. See, you can say what you mean and mean what you say, but not be mean while you're saying it. And a lot of times when people say it, they say it in a conniving way. They release it in a in a in a in a churlish type way. Everybody say churlish. Churlish, churlish means mean spirited. It's the motivation behind what they say. It's a declaration of an intention to inflict harm or pain. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord, against the Lord's disciples. Now, wait a minute. Now, this is what kind of threw me off a little bit, because one thing that you have to understand about Saul before he was changed to Paul, he was a chief Pharisee and he was doing everything in the name of God. He was doing everything in the name of the Father. He thought he was doing what he was supposed to do, but he was off because it was legalistic and it was judgmental and he had a pompous attitude. That's why the scripture says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It's about the spirit of the living God. That's what it's about. Meanwhile, Saul and Saul's name means desire. He had a desire. He had a passion was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest. Everybody say the high priest. He went to the, San the Sanhedrin council. So the Sanhedrin council was a makeup of 70 members and the, uh, and the high priest was a makeup of 71. Right? He was the high priest. He looked up high on the people. See, he set up high to look down low on the people. That's where you get the high priest from. All right? Let's go to the next. And asked him for letters. To the synagogues. Watch this. He asked them for letters to the churches in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to who? Is that a capital letter W or a lowercase letter? The way. Now one thing that you have to understand about a way is that a way is a course of life. It's the, it's the path in which you tick or uh, the path in which you tread or the path in which you take. Your word says that uh, uh, the word says in Psalms 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Path. Now, now, now watch this. The way, and that's a capital letter W. John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So then Jesus is the way. Say Jesus is the way. And he's not just the way. He's the only way. Muhammad can't, Muhammad can't get you there. Buddha can't get you there. Confucius can't get you there. The universe can't get you there. New age Christianity can't get you there. Jesus is the only way. Muhammad's bones are literally buried in the green dome in, 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 in Saudi Arabia. That's where his bones are gathered. I can go find. You can go. You can go visit his tomb. You can go visit. You can go visit a uh, uh, Gandhi. You can go visit all their tombs, but you cannot visit where Jesus is. Say, because he's not there. Oh yeah. Three days later, he got. He got up again. He rose. He rose. He rose. He rose. Hallelujah. To the way, whether men or women, he might take them as, let's go to the next. So he didn't, he, he did not discriminate men or women. He took them prisoners to Jerusalem. He was going to churches in the name of God. And one thing that you have to understand about then, back then with the, with the king's letters, the king's letters had to always be sealed. It had the king's stamp of approval. Anytime you've seen an, un, <laughs> anytime you've seen an unsealed letter, Back then, and it didn't have the king's approval. It didn't have his signet ring or his, his signature. That was a representation of, um, that the king did not send that individual, and that was to promote gossip. Because anybody along the way could read the letter. And a lot of people are sending things around to promote gossip. You have to watch who you allow in your circle. Man, the Bible says if they bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. 
Jerusalem. Let's go to the next verse. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, everybody say suddenly, a light from a specific place. Where did it come from? Now watch out because all light is not good light. The Bible says, make sure that the light you think you have is not really darkness. If you are filled with light with no dark corners, your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were shining on you. And that's the problem now. It's a lot of people who want spotlights, but they don't want God to put the floodlight on them. Because the floodlight is going to expose everything that's on the inside of you. If you're really, really seeking the Father, if you're really, really in his face, he's going to put a floodlight on you to show you you before he shows you anybody else. This word is a mirror, and a mirror shows you the reflection. And everybody wants the microphone. Everybody wants a spotlight. Let me tell you something. This right here, I did not want this. <laughs> Absolutely not. But I can tell you the fulfillment that I get from this is better than running any touchdown that I've ever ran in my life. The fulfillment that I get from this because I found purpose. The Bible says in Proverbs 19 verse 21, you can make many plans, but the, but the, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Say, I have to be in his purpose. I have to be in his purpose. In spite of what I see around me, in spite of what I, what I want to run after, in spite of my desires, I have to deny myself and I have to be in his purpose. As he neared Damascus on his journey, on his journey, everybody say on his journey. And the scripture says in Proverbs 16, verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. You may seem like you're going down the right path. You may seem like you're doing what you're supposed to do. But if it's not lined up with this word, I can promise you, you're deviated from the court of, from the courts of righteousness. <laughs> Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Let's go to the next verse. He fell to the ground and heard a voice. Everybody say a voice. voice. Holy Spirit, you're teaching today. That word voice, that word voice in the Greek literally means phone. Everybody say phone. Phone. Phone is where we get the word symphony, instrumental music. The Bible says that his voice is like the sound of many waters. It's boisterous. Anytime God speaks, everything gets in alignment. When God speaks, it's a harmonious, it's a harmonious arrangement that takes place. Phone is where we get the word symphony from. It's music to the Father's ears. Heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. And anytime you see these two in scripture, when he says, Abraham, Abraham, Saul, Saul, Moses, Moses, that's the echo of God. The echo of God means literally I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get your attention. and I want to hear everything. I want you to hear me clearly. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. Why do you persecute me? Let's go to the next verse. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up. And go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Go to verse 5, Acts chapter 9, verse 5. Acts chapter 9, verse 5. And go there in the King James Version for me. Are y'all getting fed the word this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch this. I love this. And he said, who art thou? See, you got to get ready. You got to position yourself for that King James, huh? You got you to position yourself for it, man. I'm telling you, it'll sneak up on you, boy. You get real poetic with that. <clears throat> and he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuteth. It is hard for thee to kick against the what? The pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, one thing that you have to understand about a mule or an ox, they're very stubborn. Goats are very stubborn. That's why the Bible says that at the end, he will separate the sheep from the goat. The goat will be on the left and the sheep will be on the right. They're very, very stubborn. So back then with the ox, what they would do is they had an ox goad that the owner would carry with it. And any time they tried to get the goats, uh, get the get the ox's attention, and 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 they they would kick back real hard, boom! And they had the goat, boom! 
that was real hard and it had pricks on the end of it. And it would hit it to get it back into, a, back into alignment. So, so, so what Jesus was telling Paul right here or Saul right here was, look, it's hard for you to kick against the bricks. Stop being so stubborn and surrender. <laughs> Stop being so stubborn and surrender your life. Surrender your will because that's what has to be involved in this situation. As you, as you, as you decrease, I can increase. The more you decrease in life, the more the Father can increase within you. But you have to surrender. Everybody say, I have to surrender. In, um, in 109 AD, I love, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a historical individual, so I love studying our history. In 109 AD is when, the, is when the white flag, the white flag of surrender came into being. Before then, what, what individuals would do whenever they were fighting, and, and, and they wanted to surrender in a fight was they would hold their shields over their heads. See, the shield in Scripture is a representation of faith. We have the shield of faith. Back then when they would fight in, in, in battles and things like that, they would hold their shields over their faith to say, you know what, I surrender. I don't want anymore. And the white flag didn't come into being until 109 A.D. But then I come to modern day times and, 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 and me, I want you to go in your mind with me. Anyone, anyone who, who's dealing with, with, with gang affiliated situations. I always wonder why people will always drive real, real low like that. Have y'all seen that before? I'm serious. Have y'all seen it? Raise your hand if you've seen it before. Y'all sitting up here like y'all have Facebook. Raise your hand. And then I get ready. They get real cool with it. Right? You get ready, yeah, and then you turn real hard. Can't even see over the wheel, right? Ooh, I'm, I'm tired now. Right? So, so, so the reason why they did this, the reason why they would actually get real, real low, we thought it was to be cool, but they did that so that they won't be susceptible to gunfire. They used the door as a shield. That's why gang members would do situations like that. They would use it as a shield so it would be. So if a bullet did come, it wouldn't hit him up top. So that's why they lean. Say, I have to get the origin. I have to go back to situations. I have to go back to the genesis of why situations occur so that I can know. That's why you have to study. The scripture says to study to show your self-approved, not to show your pastor. You study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed rightly. Dividing the word of truth because I can't wrongly divide it if the Holy Spirit is not helping me. Right, so when I'm surrendering, I have to most definitely understand that I have to relinquish my will. I have to say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Let's uh let's get ready to wrap it up. Let's get ready to wrap it up. Let's go to uh Let's go to Psalms 46, Psalms 46, verse 10. Hallelujah. If y'all get something this morning, say praise God. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalms 46, verse 10. This is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. What's the first two words? Be still. Ah, ah, ah. When I surrender to the Father, the first thing that I have to do is be still. Now, he didn't say be quiet. There's a difference between being quiet and being still. To be still, if you go back to the Hebrew and look at that word, it means Rapha. Everybody say Rapha. That word Rapha means to relax. Relax. It's a cease in activity, it's a cease in moving. Just be still. Because if I'm still, that means that I'm no longer leaning on my own understanding and I'm allowing the Father to take the lead in my life. Be still and being quiet is totally different things. Uh, being quiet is the complete absence of sound. Sometimes I do have to quiet myself so that I can hear back from the Father because prayer is a two-way street. If I'm in a relationship 
And I'm talking, 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 talking. Whether y'all know it or not, Shawana is the one who talks in our relationship. I'm serious. Y'all, y'all, y'all think like, well, Pastor, no, I, I, do I talk a lot? I don't really talk a lot. I don't really talk a lot, but sure, huh? My baby, wait, wait, wait till later, and then you can talk to me about it. Look, 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 it's three or four o'clock in the morning. You sleep? Shawana, you know I'm asleep. <laughs> You know I'm asleep, girl. I'm like, man, you you up on Pinterest and oh, we gonna eat this tomorrow. Man, it's three in the morning. <laughs> it's three in the morning. It's three. It's three in the morning. So being quiet is the complete absence of sound. It's the complete absence of sound. You're quieting yourself. Be still. And what's the next two words? Amen. If I'm not still, I won't know the character of God. If I'm doing all of this moving and, 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 and I got to have my hand here and got to have my hand there, I'm going to wear myself out. I have to be still. I have to quiet myself so that I can know, so that I can come into the complete understanding or the complete knowledge of who the Father is. You have to quiet yourself and you have to practice that. And is it easy? <clears throat> Absolutely not. I can prove to you that it's not easy. Let's go to Psalms 131. Psalms 131 verse 1 and start there. Be still and know that I am God. Thank you. Psalms 131, verse 1. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. All right, watch this, watch this. This is David speaking. My heart is not, is not proud, O oh Lord. My eyes are not haughty. Meaning I don't walk like this in a prideful state. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. This is a scripture that I always stand on. If it's beyond me, I just turn it over to the Father. I surrender it. I don't concern myself. And we said that there's a difference between worry and concern. Worry will have you up all night long. Concern, I literally roll a responsibility over to the Father. I don't concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Let's go to the next verse. But, watch this, I have done what? I have stilled and, ah, there's a difference. There's a difference. I have stilled, meaning I have calmed, I've relaxed. Jesus told the storm, peace, be still. So what did he do? He, 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 he rebuked what he couldn't see, but he spoke to what he could see. He said, peace, be still. But I have stilled and quieted my what? It's the soul man that makes the most noise. It's the soul man that gets out of hand. And I have to feed my spirit the word of God. And the more and more word I put on the inside of me, the more and more that's going to quiet my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. It's so easy for you to find yourself in a state where everything is cattywampus, and now you've, now you've literally forgotten the benefits of the Father. Because you've allowed yourself to get in a soulish realm. You've allowed yourself to get in the flesh. But you have to, you have to still and quiet your soul like what kind of child? Ooh. Ooh. David said he did this to his soul. See, the flesh is the slave. The flesh is going to do is going to go wherever, wherever, the, wherever the, uh, the master tells it to go, because this is the order. This is the order. The spirit is the king. The soul is the servant and the flesh is the slave. The spirit is your king. The soul is the servant and the flesh is the slave. What do you do with the slave? Bah, you have to beat it. So this, this flesh, this is what gives you your physical authority while you're here on this earth realm. Without this, spirits are illegal. A spirit is illegal without this body, without this covering here on this earth realm. Watch this. He says, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. One of the hardest things for us to do was to get Caleb in the beginning to sleep in his own bed. Because he was so accustomed to running in there where we were. He was so accustomed that, that, that at a certain time of night, I'm hearing them little feet. Like, oh, here he goes, Sean. I said, like, yep, let, let me move on over. 
But we got to a point to where we said, no, son, I want you to stay in your room. You have to stay in your room. And then he'll stay in there a little longer and a little longer and a little longer. And before you know it, he was sleeping in his bed by himself all throughout the night. But it took a while to wing him from out of our bed. It took a while to wing him uh, uh, for, uh, for, for purposes of pot. To wean him from off of his sippy cup, it took a while to wean him. And see, I think the mom's supposed to do that. Now, I'm the one with the patience in that area. See, she want to do the talking, but I have patience. <laughs> so I helped. I helped him. I helped him in that area. It was hard. It was hard. We still pushing through some situations, trying to get him to eat a little bit. But he'll, be, he'll, he'll get there. He'll get there. All he want noodle, mac and cheese. That's all he want. Pot tart. Pot tart. Pot tart is good. It's good. But it's hard to wean yourself from certain situations. But you have to wean your soul from things that you know are not profiting you. You have to wean your soul from things that you know are not uh, uh, edifying and, and, and bringing glory to the Father. Jesus said, I brought glory to you here on earth by doing everything you told me to do. That's how I bring glory to the Father. By doing everything he tells me to do, not what man tells me to do. Because it's not about what man, man's word is not the final say over what the father has told me to do. The Bible says we must obey God rather than man. Does that make sense to y'all? Hallelujah. I want y'all to say praise God if y'all got something this morning. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Facebook. So before we leave, we want to give y'all an opportunity. If there's anybody who has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to pray that prayer with you. If you want to rededicate your life. We want to pray that with you as well. At salvation, you're literally being rescued from damnation. And you're being brought into the kingdom of the son of his love. The Bible says giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son of his love in Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13. So if that's you and you know that you're headed for grave destruction, and let me tell you something. If you have to think, um, man, am I saved? Am I not saved? It's time to get right with, father, with the Father. You shouldn't have to think about it. Man, you know what? If something was to happen today, tragic, I don't even really know if I'm going to go to heaven or not. Let's change that right now. And it's not just with your mouth. It's with your heart. It's a heart issue. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want y'all to stretch your hands forth and we want to pray for them. Say, Father, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe that he died and three days later he got up again. And now that same Life-giving spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you said that, we believe that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We want you to inbox us. And we want to, you know, we want to carry out the prayer, man. And we want to continue to pray for you. And we, we're praying for you diligently. And we thank God for you. And we thank God for your soul. And, um... This next call is for rededication. You're saying, you know what? I've accepted your son as my Lord and Savior, but in all actuality, I haven't been living the way that I'm supposed to. And I want to get back right with the Father. If that's you, or even if that's you here, and you want to make that decision to say, you know what? I want to, I want to get my life back right with the Father. I, I, I haven't been living the way that I'm supposed to. The Father wants to welcome you back with open arms. I want you to pray this prayer with me, and I want y'all to pray along with us. Say, Father, Father I, realize I realize that I've deviated, that I've deviated from, the from the path of righteousness. And this day, and this day I, make the I make the confession to get my life back right with you. I realize, I realize that, I'm a sinner, that I'm a sinner, and I need your grace. Say, I, say Father, Father, I thank you for welcoming me back with open arms, flaws and all. Say, Satan, I renounce you. I will have nothing more to do with your kingdom. I'm a blood washed and a blood bought child of the living God. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We love you guys.